Thank you very much. Uh, this, uh, so th this is a warning. Um, you won't see many fancy slides. You will see code here. So anyone not interested in code or live st stuff in the terminal should leave now. <laughs> Last chance. Okay. Um, I want to pass a challenge to you first. So um, what is the biggest issue for Moodle? That's a question. You just can meditate over it uh, during the presentation. We will get back to that stuff at last uh, in the finish. So who am I? I'm Carsten Nielsen, I'm living in Germany, working mainly for clients in the Nordics. That means uh, Norway, uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark. And uh, I'm working with PHP since nearly the beginning. I don't know, PHP 4 or something, PHP 5. It was the time that we were talking PHTML before it got PHP. Um, and with the Moodle actively since uh, 2011. Uh, the project I'm working on is uh, a project of the Norwegian uh, state supporting uh, students in math and uh, language learning for uh, migrants and or even uh, Ukrainian childs that have uh, moved to Norway. And beside that I'm a drummer, I'm a Viking reenactor, and I'm beer brewing, so to complete all the cliches. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I'm a tinkerer. I like to build things, not even in code, but in real life. I'm fixing my car myself and such things. So I like to have my hands dirty and going into the terminal is the virtual way, getting your hands dirty. So that's uh, what's supposed to happen today. So what is uh, I'm trying to do with Composer? Composer is already used in uh, Moodle but only for automated testing in, uh, our, in the complete core development and it's highly integrated into the ticket system we have and the tracking and so on. I'm uh, by side, I'm not related to Moodle or to Composer, so I'm just a developer working since years and uh, uh, always stumbling a bit over issues here in my process that I am uh, seeing on other vendors like uh, Drupal, for example. That's the other part I'm working mainly with. Um, what we could do with Composer is um, automatically deploy a defined state of Moodle. So not just Moodle, but Moodle with a defined set of plugins, for example. And that is usually the case when you have many customers. Uh, the customer X want to have a Poodle Mini lesson installed and a customer Y is working uh, with H5P and so on. And so you can describe this situation in Composer and Composer is taking care for you about anything that needs to be installed, moved or whatever. Um, the cool thing about Composer is that it's, it's able to solve very, very complex dependencies in this uh, working uh, process of passing code and uh, plugins and everything in place so that you really have a running configuration. And uh, I like to tinker with such things even because we can it, tinker, I said, uh, notoriously. Today, when we're working uh, slowly uh, in, a, in a single project with Moodle, uh, I'm not talking the cloud hosting stuff or uh, big deployments or anything. I'm talking about one project because I'm a, I'm a self-employed developer working since years. And if I have the possibility to serve my customers uh, on different state with the same product, I would like to have a sort of automation or a standard I can move in and define those environments where I'm working with. And compose uh, in, in Moodle, this is just now happening by uh, custom script scripts uh, developed by Moodle. So you have many opportunities to fix things in Moodle, but you have to go in, you have to know the admin, the CLI uh, command you have to run. Uh, you, maybe you're writing a bash script or a make script or whatever just to automate that things for you. And uh, if we look at this here, um, when we want to update plugins 
actually. We have a running installation in uh, Moodle. We have installed 20 plugins. Everything is fine now. We get an uh, mail with security issues for different uh, stuff. So we go in in our admin backend, look at the plugin states, and we say, okay, we have those five plugins that has to be updated. Then we have uh, the first opportunity is we go in and do it live in the admin backend. We click on update, and the server is handling everything for us. And that is a bad idea. Security wise, you have to leave writing rights to the server. And that means every upload that is happening into your source environment, into your directories where your code lives, um, you have to open all these directories so that the server can write code and store code where it belongs. But that means every user can do so because the user got the same rights as the web server in that case. So that means every upload that's happening in Moodle is a potential security risk if you go don't handle it right. And so I as a developer and a notorious security nerd and a, a GDPR fighter and whatever um, don't want to have this hole on my server. So that's working fine if you're running 50 uh, users inside your university in an internal network, but as soon as you go out in the world and you have an open web server, you won't, you, you will not live long and prosper if you're doing it this way. So the other way around is that you check your list, then you, rem you have to remove manually the old plugin code, download the new plugin code, move it manually into the folders again, and then you go and uh, run the front end update and everything. So that's a very simple task, but you have to do it manual. You have to go in, copy, paste, download, delete, everything. And as we all know, manual action is not fail safe. We can do it 500 times, really cool, and then we were on the Moodle party and the next morning we're doing it the wrong way. So, and then we have the issue. And that's, that's actually uh, worse if you're gonna really upgrading Moodle itself as a solely instance on a machine. You have to get rid of the old installation completely, copy the new Moodle stuff over, and then you have to know where, which plugin did I install and copy every one of them over to the new installation. And it's up to you to define this Configuration. You have to have a list or whatever where you, or you have to, to do a, sh a screen dump of your plugin list, what are the additional uh, plugins I have. And uh, we're coming later to the point where the fuck is Moodle storing all the plugins? So it's just a, a critical thing there where they are storing the code. We are running uh, to, to um, I don't like that set of work in it, just deleting the complete code base and copying over the new version. So we run a slightly other way. We are patching our code base. We're just taking, uh, maybe we are on uh, Moodle 4.1.3 and the new 4.1.4 is coming out. I'm just doing a, uh, creating a patch from 1.4 to 1.4.5 and then I'm applying that patch to our code base. So I know it's exactly that what we want. Uh, I'm hoping that everything is uh, working fine in that case, but uh, that's much faster and uh, easier for me as a developer to be on track there. So I don't, I don't have to manage a list of plugins because they are untouched, they're left there. So Composer is there to, to, to help us solve all these problems. Um, Composer is a depend, uh, application level dependency manager. Um, if you look at Linux or whatever, if you take uh, apt or uh, pacman on arch level, that's a dependency manager on the system level. So where I can define dependencies that the web server has or PHP has or whatever. And this is application level. So we are going down to a Moodle or Drupal or whatever and this one has the ability to clear, clear up dependencies just in this realm. Um, it's inspired by NPM and uh, Bundler from Ruby 
And it's even that time it came up where we had a, a lot of new languages coming up in the, in the community, uh, like Ruby and Node. Uh, it uh, started by some guys from the Symfony team in 2011, and we're currently in a, I think, 2.2 version. And it's uh, pretty fast, uh, and it since then has become nearly the de facto standard for dependency management on project base. So that's, that's a composer and a glimpse. And as I said, Moodle is already using it for the BIT testing, uh, working pretty fine, everything's cool, uh, despite of some things that is in our way to really implement that as a usable tool for us developers. So uh, those uh, QR codes are leading to composer page on the front page we have, uh, to my LinkedIn page and so on. So just if you want to. So when I'm talking dependencies, what I'm meaning here, you have a project that wants to have, uh, or that, that we have the first level of dependency. I want to have a plugin uh, fixing a forum, or I want to plug in uh, fixing a newsletter tool for my, my project. That is first level dependency. And those, both those dependencies can have a dependency too. Both are building uh, or using a library uh, working as mailer, for example. And that can go further and further and further. And to make it more complex, you don't have those libraries, you have even versions. So the first library wants a mailer uh, with a version higher than 1.3. The second library needs a mailer with a version at least 1.4. And Composer can take all this stuff and create a um, configuration that's working, that's solving all these dependencies you have defined in your, or, or is defined by the functionality you want to, to achieve with this configuration. So that's, that's the magic of Composer. Um, the workflow here is you have a composer.json, that's a, uh, a thing you will find everywhere if you start uh, Composer. Uh, start working with Composer. Composer JSON is a configuration file for Composer itself, for the project, for plugins. It's just, uh, you find it everywhere. And uh, the cool thing is, because it's called Composer JSON, it won't interfere with anything else. So it's just Composer reading this stuff, um, and that makes it very convenient to find all your configurations if you have a struggle with some configuration or whatever. Um, Composer calculates a working package configuration for you, and you can use it to download the required packages, put it in, in place where they belong. Uh, then you can use Composer to check for updates if the package is, uh, needs a security update, a major upgrade, a lower upgrade, whatever. Uh, and then what's cool is Composer has a plugin system itself. So you can extend this functionality and you can even fetch patches from forums or whatever. So you can define code uh, repositories like GitHub or whatever, but you can even pull a zip file from a forum where you say, okay, that's an issue that hasn't gone in core yet or hasn't, uh, hasn't been fixed by the plugin maintainer. I'm just pulling the patch directly out of this forum post and putting it into my project just now, just to get, just, just to get it working. And um, as soon as the plugin maintainer is uh, updating its code, Composer will say, okay, I have an issue here. So this version is not working anymore with the patch I uh, put in before. But at least as long as this issue occurs and you rely on this patch from the forum, Composer knows about it, Every update will include this single patch, and that's a quite cool thing if you're living a bit uh, on the brink and on the edge and want to stay uh, secure with your system or, or with a new functionality that isn't quite mature yet or has some issues. issues. And uh, another thing that is some, uh, uh, some which struggles me a bit if I'm working with the Moodle is, is we are still in a sort of spaghetti, spaghetti code way. We have many legacy plugins starting. Uh, if you're starting reading the code of an, a plugin, you make a, a, a journey back in time, 10 years. You're starting with index HTML, and then you have a, 
a huge matrix with uh, switch then or if then uh, uh, stuff is the formula cancelled okay not then do this so and that's uh, not the way it's supposed to to happen today we're working in a, we're living in a code object oriented code world where we should have classes and uh, such defined de uh, definements there and this is uh, Eve handled by Composer 2. Composer can generate auto loaders for you. If you're importing a uh, mailer, library, whatever, then Composer knows that and generates a file that you can include in all your stuff and then your app knows I have the mailer and it knows how to access this mailer. So it makes the life convenient for us developers too if this is implemented the right way. So. Now, I'm uh, trying to do this live. I hope the, the internet connection is stable. So uh, we just uh, go for it and then we will see where, we are, where we're landing with this. And uh, now this is the, the thing I was talking about when I warned you. We're really going into uh, a, a live composer session here. Maybe I should make it bigger. So, and I'm now taking uh, first example how it's supposed to work. And I'm taking Drupal because I work much with Drupal too and there it's working pretty well. So I'm just uh, going this way here. So I'm now in a, in a folder called demo. It's uh, completely empty, that one. There's nothing inside there. Drupal has a convenient method as it has a, a sort of a project template uh, lying in the web. I just can relate on that one and there we have some basic configuration inside that is uh, make up a usable Drupal uh, configuration. So I'm just importing that one. We will see here. Uh, well, I have uh, done this before. So if we go through this uh, command here, then you see I'm just calling composer. I'm calling the uh, uh, command create project. Then I'm relating to Drupal slash recommended project. Uh, Drupal test is the directory where all code uh, shall be copied to. And I have chosen to take uh, the approach of no install just now so that we only generate the configuration file. It won't fetch any information or data from the web. So I'm running that one. And now you see that that's how Composer is working. It's just uh, going to the repo, fetching those uh, uh, project, recommended project files and storing them in the folder that I have defined before. So now I should have a Drupal test folder and if I go inside there, you see a composer JSON and a composer J uh, log file. JSON is defining what I want, log file is defining what have I done. So what is the state? Because uh, we're going into the JSON file uh, shortly and I'll show what's the difference between a JSON file, a configuration and a log file. So let's have a look at that one. So this is compa composer JSON file. As the name suggests, the format is JSON. So uh, here you can see this is the basic configuration for a, for a Drupal project. You have, uh, you define a repository here in this line. It's a composer repository, it's composer compatible. We can, we are, uh, we will go on and define other types here soon in the, in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, this one is relating to packages.drupal.org which is a server just providing composer information about all the plugins uh, or modules, how it's called in the Drupal world, is delivering. And we're talking, and on the module scene, we have in, uh, in uh, Moodle, we, I think 2,000 plugins. Moodle, we're talking 25,000 modules. So that's really, really ma ma many, m much stuff to keep track of. So, and here you see some core dependencies, composer installers, Drupal core recommended. Uh, and you want a minimum stability of stable, for example. So this, this is how a kind complex composer JSON file looks. We will have a, a much simpler version for our Moodle test. 
So here you're defining uh, what you want to have. And if we go out here, and take a look at the Compose log file. Then you see that every, everything we want to have has, gets a content hash so that you really know, okay, that's the version. Because as you, if you can, if you look at the Compose JSON file, take that one, you can see so-called constraints. So I'm defining, or they are defining, they want to have the composer slash installers library. And they want at least the version 2.0. It can be 2.1, 2.3, or 2.1.1, but it has to be 2.0. And the composer log file is defining which one do I have actually now. So uh, when you're checking for updates, composer is just jumping into the log file, taking the hash, sending that to the composer server and the composer server is saying, okay, there's a new one. And then you can see that in the composer update. So it's a quite convenient way to, to, to start a project. And as soon as you're clear with your configuration here, uh, you simply run a composer install. Or in this case, we have already installed. We've gone, we are doing a composer update. And I will put on the, this one, this one is always helpful if you're running Linux Commons. Uh, it's a verbose mode, so you see everything is happening in, in the background. So now you will be flashed with, oh, damage. <laughs> okay, we take this one. Not double dash, just one. So loading, let's see. I'm in, in the, I'm not in the right directory. There we have it. So, now you see, this one is checking everything on the remote server. And uh, the connection is quite good, I see. It's caching it locally and hopefully downloading the stuff. As said, we're living on the brink here. If the net is going down, we won't go further. And you can have a second coffee. There, okay. So, let's see what we have here. We go right up, and you see, here you can see the, some messages that we would, you would even see without the verbose mode. It's installing dependencies, libraries that Drupal wants to have, uh, t marking the versions in the log file, and after that, you should have a running Drupal version. So if we look into the, our uh, directory here, we see, I'm just clearing up the screen. We have now a vendor directory and we have a web directory. In the web directory, we will have some uh, Moodle, uh, Drupal stuff and in the vendor directory, we have all the dependencies sorted after their naming so that's quite cool. I can pass a composer JSON file to anyone. That's just a bit of 80 kilobytes or whatever. And this person is able to install exact the same configuration on, if I pass the log file with, exact the same configuration I have done on my machine. So that's, that's it's, uh, how it's supposed to work with the uh, composer. And we can even see which shouldn't, shouldn't be the, f uh, the case now. We can run a composer outdated and maybe we just reduce that to the Drupal realm in this case. And then you say, okay, everything is up to date. Just checking for the, for the plugins, everything. And that's the cool thing. That's the cool thing. That's, that's an easy task. And you don't have to move anything manually around in this case. So what, what do we want to do now? Let's see. Um, what, about, what about a plugin? We have create project. Uh, 
we will see. I just have to import uh, some help here. We should see history Drupal. So there. If you want, there do we have that one, that one. So this, for example, uh, I don't know, is, is, can you read that or is it too low on the screen? So otherwise I will uh, just uh, move up a bit. So if you want to add a plug or a module called in Drupal, you just define that requirement with the composer. So normally you don't have to go into the JSON file and add things manually. You just can use composer to add this. So in this case, I just want to have the Drupal slash admin toolbar uh, and I want to have it in the version 3.4.0. So just doing that one. And as you see, that one is, it's putting the information in the log file, in the JSON file, it's downloading the files in the right uh, uh, directory and, uh, and we're done. That's it. That's how an installation should work. So, and if I'm now passing Composer JSON and Composer log file to my uh, developer or my customer and they are running Composer install, they will get exactly the same code base as I have. It, that's just five lines of code and it's so convenient, really. Um, if we now look uh, into our Drupal directory structure here, then one thing that Drupal and Moodle has in common is they store their plugins or modules inside the core directory structure. It's just like Moodle has 500 different uh, paths where you, where you can store your plugins because Moodle's core architecture is built around this that it has to be somewhere in this folder. Uh, all activity has to li live in the, uh, or all activity plugins have to live in the mod uh, directory uh, and so on. And it's, and it's even going deeper. So all uh, editors you have Atto or TinyMC or CK Editor, whatever, they are living in lib editors and then you have their CK Editor and then you have lib editors Atto plugins where you have other parts. So, so that's, the, how do you keep track of that? And um, Drupal has only two or three maps where they store all the stuff, that's modules, that's themes and then they have an external uh, stuff for libs. But the main stuff, is stored in core, that's Drupal, Drup and Drupal only. You don't mess with that map. You can go into look for something or whatever, but you don't do anything that, that's where Drupal's code live. And that makes it easy to upgrade because it's completely on the other, on the other scale. It's out of your responsibility to deal with this uh, folder. You're only working in the sites and the themes folder if you want to, or modules. So that's, that's uh, a thing and we have installed a module and if you see here, we're just going into web modules and it's a, uh, then they have a thing, you can do contrib modules that are modules lying in their uh, repo or you can have custom modules that's local development, only you have access to that. So they have modules, contrib modules and custom modules. So this one should live in the contrib and if I look there, we have admin toolbar for you there. Admin toolbar is the map where this code is living. So that's, that's Composer. Composer has a done, done a very good job for us just now. And now we want to see how handles Composer. We take another shot here on Composer outdated command. Just for your information, this, this are the commands you can, you can do with Composer. Quite convenient, just hack it in and every one of that has a detailed helping page so it's convenient to work with that one. So if I go in Composer update Drupal slash store, checking for updates and then we see, okay, everything is fine again. So we have the last one. That's 
cool. Oh, wait, we can, we can do another one here. I'm just, uh, as I said, this will be a live coding session. If I have a good idea, I will do it. So, if I go in and I just work on my composer JSON file, let's see if that is working. That's the composer JSON file we saw before. Now we have required the admin toolbar and it's uh, added to the composer JSON file automatically by composer. And as you see here, we don't have any constraint. We, have, we want to have the version 3.4.0. And if I want to check if there are, uh, or I, I have defined a fixed version, but I want to get in updates, available updates, I have to define a constraint that, that makes it possible that you have anything younger than 3.4, newer than 3.4. This is defining 3.4 dot, that, what is, that was it. So now we're just doing, let's see here, uh, we are doing a requirement, let's see, uh, 3.4, if I'm adding that one here, and then you see, Composer is, I, I've changed the constraint to a more flexible style and as soon as I do that, Composer is checking, okay, there is a newer version currently. So it's just fetching the code, installing it, done. So that's how you handle updates if you do it manually. Despite uh, anything I'm doing here, the complete session is considered a question, <laughs> a Q and A. So if you have questions, just raise your hand and throw it in. So I like dialogues. So let's see what we have here. Uh, that was something that was composed JSON admin toolbar. That's cool. Yes. Okay, now I run Composer removed Drupal admin toolbar and uh, Composer is just removing the code. So I can get rid of old stuff too. Composer is just dealing with it. So, and we have any option running here in the command line and it's normally it's just one row, one command short, defined and that makes it easy to have them in uh, automatic deployments, in uh, setting up environments for automated testing um, and that is uh, the, the core uh, strength of a Composer. You are, it's so simple that you can use it in your everyday work and it's so, so easy and simple that it's quite fail safe to use it in automated scenarios. So, and that's quite a, a bummer for me or makes my life as a developer very easy uh, or easier. I don't know if, if uh, developing for Moodle is considered easy ever. <laughs> or, yeah? Go on. What, do you have to be a higher, or we need a microphone? Ah, there. there we yes. Yes, uh, you, you can uh, actually downgrade. Um, uh, the, there are two ways. Uh, either you leave it to Composer, uh, then it's uh, sometimes complaining about uh, not, uh, or good dependencies. The easy way to, up, uh, to downgrade is really just get rid of the plugin and install it with another constraint. And then it, uh, Composer will uh, develop or, or calculate a new dependency chain and everything and caching everything up. So it, it is possible to downgrade. It's, uh, but make sure if you're running Drupal or Moodle that you do that before you update the database. Because we always, in Drupal it's ne nearly the same as in Moodle. We have a two stage uh, set of installation and upgrading and that means we're upgrading the code and then we have to go into the front and, and run the front end script so that the uh, database changes or whatever has uh, taking place is taking place and if you have done that it's quite hard to get back to another version so uh, always back up before you do that. <laughs> better, better, uh, always back up. Yes, there? Uh, I see that you installed some plugin but you don't figure where to be deployed. So how it's done in Composer? 
Uh, I want to start to do it in Moodle and tell them that all the plugin of mod, this plugin will be in mod directory. Yeah. So how you can set uh, different directory for the, each uh, package that you install? Uh, do you mean the, the directories where it's installed in? Yeah. Or? You do composer require admin tool, admin yeah. toolbar. And then yeah. You okay. Um, uh, how I find this one, the name, you mean? Oh, or? Yeah. How we know to do it on uh, web modules, country? Oh, no, 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 no. That's the cool thing about Composer. I'm not in the in the web uh, uh, location here. I'm I'm in the root directory, and I'm I'm in the in the same directory where the Composer JSON live. And I'm if I'm running Composer require this plugin or this module, Composer knows exactly where it has to store this code. Where this it has is actually my question. How yeah. we know where it's configured. Okay, that, that's, the that's, the that's the easy part. I show you directly and that's why I want the dialogue. Exactly, cool. So if I run this one, I'm just checking the web modules contrib. Ah, no, wait. Where do, ah, I, I, de I deinstalled it. I have to install it again, sorry. There. So I've just in a, in a in a time frame of three minutes I've installed, deinstalled, installed again without any issues. So and now I'm showing you where this is defined. We have uh, on the first brink we have this one. We look at this one. If we go into the composer JSON file that Drupal is providing us. Then you see this one here. Installer pass. That's inter uh, uh, this one is building on the uh, Composer plugin, Composer Installers. And Composer Installers is a plugin for a Composer that is taking um, many frameworks like WordPress, Drupal, even Moodle, I will show that later on, uh, and tries to find out where should I store which uh, sort of plugin. And as you can see here, we have uh, some stuff is Drupal core. It's type Drupal core, and it has to be stored in web core. Type Drupal library should live in web library. And here you have that one that we have run. Uh, that stuff we're running with is a Drupal module, and it has to live in web modules country. So the module registering itself as a Drupal, as a Drupal module? Exactly. Yeah, and now, and now this, is, this is a definition where Drupal wants the code to live. And now we look at the module itself. So we're just going this. We're going in web, modules, contrib, admin toolbar, composer JSON. And what you see here in the third row, you have type Drupal module. And that one was defined in the, in the Drupal world. And that's exactly where, where uh, Composer has its strengths. You can nearly configure everything in that one, and you can add your custom plugin, and you can add custom scripts that should be run after the installation, before the installation, whatever. So you can really create a Composer version for yourself, running just for your local development at home or in the office. Um, but it's much, much better if an environment or a, a framework, a, a project like Moodle defines this for you, just like Drupal do. Th they have done a huge job. They had the same issue we are sitting in just now in Moodle, uh, had Drupal with the version 7. Se version 7 was the last Drupal session with a fucking amount of spaghetti code and a very bad architecture for us developers. And as they changed over to Drupal 8, that was a major, huge rewrite of the complete system, building everything uh, around the stuff that we can work object oriented. We have namespaces, we have auto loading, we have composer integration and everything. And so, and that makes the life so much easier and that really created a Drupal version that's, I, I, will, I wouldn't call it CMS anymore. It's not a content management system. It's a really a development framework. You can do anything with that one, with that stuff. 
And that's quite cool. But it was a huge effort they had to, to take to get to that position. And um, that's why I'm standing here. I like how they handled the things with Composer. And I would like to have the same easiness, the same security, the same uh, yeah, uh, convenience in developing for Moodle with Composer. But that takes uh, us to the point where we have to start planning that because uh, actually Moodle is quite complex in its structure and we, if we want to reach that goal anywhere soon in the future, we have to start actually now. Uh, and it will take a while before we are where, uh, there where Drupal is, but uh, at least we should try uh, because I think that's, that's the way to go. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, they're over there. Uh, so as I, as I understand, this is the composer JSON file of a plugin, right? Not of your project, the one that you have opened now. It's the, compo the, the composer JSON file is a part. Of, of, is, but uh, this is the composer JSON file of a plugin. Right. Yes. It defines what type the plugin is, what's the title of the plugin, yes, and also the version number of the plugin, probably. Uh, no. Uh, no. There I'm but, coming but, to. The requirements, how, how yes. is this plugin requiring some other? Uh, in, in this case, uh, you, I've just uh, scrolled through it. This uh, plugin is not defining any other dependencies just now, but it could. Okay. It could define dependencies, and we could have five uh, plugins defining the same dependency, and Composer will figure out which version of this dependency is working with all five plugins, even if they are demanding uh, different versions. And if you have two plugins demanding version that are not compatible, Composer will tell you that so that you can take measures, uh, actions, whatever is needed. Uh, either choose one of those or update one of the plugins or whatever. But uh, Composer is quite cool in, in spitting out hints where the issue can lie. Uh, and uh, that's uh, helpful for us developers too. Uh, and it has some handy tools uh, built in. If we, for example, just ask Composer why Drupal uh, admin toolbar, then it's just saying, okay, it's the code project that required it's this one. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to a dependency of a dependency, and I ask, as uh, on my, on my uh, other slide here, uh, if I would ask uh, Composer why Mailer, it would list plugin forum and plugin newsletter mm -hmm. as those who are demanding this dependency. So it's giving me even tools to analyze my setup and getting into the issues that may occur during uh, running this stuff. So it's a, a quite cool tool to build a good environment. It's quite tool, a co cool tool to keep it safe and updated the easy way, and it's a cool tool to debug your system if you're uh, stumbling over some issues there. So, any other questions just now, or I'm just continuing? I have enough stuff. <laughs> I don't know where we are, time. Huh? What is it? I huh? 13 passes. Yeah, okay, 13 passes. I, I guess I had a bit of a question, sorry. Right yeah, ah, over there. Um, <laughs> obviously, Moodle is not at all organized like this, as, yes. as you said. Um, I'm sort of kind of, I'm very much used to the idea of you create, uh, you know, we work with Git, we create repos, we uh, commit the plugins to a customer's repo, we then deploy, use Git to deploy that to a customer's site. If you were going down the composer route, would we be basically say, instead of doing that, we'd go to the server and we'd run Composer no. on the server and deploy it. So how, how do you get from using Composer to get all the plugins together to actually deploying it yeah. onto a customer's site? I know where you're going. I, or, or, I, or I am, yeah, that was a huge discussion when Composer came up. And it's what all, it was always the discussion with the other dependency manager, uh, uh, managers as well. And uh, I know people or developers that are really just shipping the Composer JSON and Composer log files and say, okay, if, uh, even in the deployment, they're just deploying this file and then they're going to the production server and saying Composer update. 
And they are, I, I think, it's uh, my approach is a more conser conservative uh, thing because that is, uh, or the, the permission running this one is that the composer package server is online. You have connection to that one because you have to pull in new code. Uh, composer on the server has to run. Uh, composer is in that case an additional part of software that can, can uh, provoke issues in the production system in my case. So I'm always taking the conservative way of running this. I'm running this locally in my development environment. And if you go to Drupal and look at the standard uh, git ignore file, for example, let's see if it's in here. Uh, not there. Let me see here. Yes, no, no, it's not in here just now. Okay, but uh, what? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, yeah, maybe you're right. So let's see. Vendor and then um, uh, the, the Git ignore file is in the, living in the Git Drupal vendor, but that wouldn't yeah, maybe okay. We see, we see. Core recommended. Not really there. No, no. Okay, but what I want to say is, usually folks are running Composer and then they have a Git ignore file, ignoring the vendor directory. The vendor directory is just uh, hoarding every external plugin that is not directly related to Drupal. So uh, maybe the mailer or whatever. That are PHP uh, libraries that are working with uh, any, any uh, project or any integration would work. They're, they are not Drupal related. We could even use them in Moodle if we want to. And all this stuff is hoarded in the vendor directory. And uh, normally projects just ignore the vendor directory, but that means you have to go to the server and run a composer install or composer update to fill up this vendor directory. And that's something I'm not doing because it's dependent on a running uh, packages server delivering the code and anything. I'm committing my code, including the vendor directory, to the customer's repo. And that's my reference to, for deployment. But if I have... Uh, uh, I want to start a new project, for example. I can have my own composer configuration where I start from scratch. So and that, that's uh, just a quite uh, usual way for me as a, as a uh, freelance developer that I have some templates I start with. I have, I don't know, I have six or seven running Drupal instances that are built around composer for seven different uh, clients and they're running for years now. I just can, that's, five minutes to upgrade the system with Composer locally and then deploying the code over. So, but it's huge, it's helpful for me and I'm not talking any complex uh, uh, test chain or whatever integration with Jira or whatever. That would get much easier if you have this tool relatedly and, and uh, good implemented into Moodle as a project. Yes, so. Let's see if we can, uh, 15, 17, how long do I have? Four, four, huh? You have uh, 22 minutes. Uh, 22 minutes, okay. Let's see where we can get in that Sorry, time. 12 minutes. 12 minutes. Ah, uh, okay, I had a lot more on the list. So, okay, let's just jump in. Um, what Composer can do, or is doing in the back end, is we have a local Composer JSON, that one goes to Packagist Org uh, in the Drupal case here. Packagist is uh, uh, driven by the, by the Composer developers. It's a repository where everyone can, uh, everyone in the open source community can uh, push their packages. Uh, and then you have a, a very nice matrix there. Let's see if we open that one just so. And .org. So, this is a repo about uh, thousand, hundreds of thousands libraries available for the PHP community. Uh, Drupal is running an own instance of this one. And that was uh, my plan to get into that one, but okay. Uh, you can't always uh, get what you want. So, because uh, Composer is 
has a running server or a working server that you can implement on your own. So it, there's nothing in the way that Moodle shouldn't, as organization, provide an own package server just like Drupal does. So we, we could have packages.moodle.org serving just like this and be a hub for us developers fetching our uh, plugins that we need. So this is packages uh, delivering all the stuff we need. And Packagist has a, a method in syncing with GitHub or other Git uh, repositories like Bitbucket or GitLab, you name it. Everyone, uh, Git Composer has a huge list of supported uh, sources you can use. And uh, Packagist uh, lets you implement some GitHub actions. So if you're updating your package on GitHub, GitHub is signaling that to Packagist, and Packagist is pulling in a new version. And the versions are, um, that Packagist is taking care of are defined by GitHub or, or Git tags. If you define your tags, you see, OK, uh, version 1.0, uh, 1.1, 1.3. Uh, Packages knows about that, and as soon as you do the update request, it will just fetch those tags. So we have a, a quite simple setup. So create a GitHub repo, define your versions with tags, and then uh, push this to packages, and you're, you're good to go. You have a plugin that is downloadable by Composer. It's co costless, effortless, free. Uh, if you want some more extra features or closed uh, source stuff, you can buy that from packages. They have a, a, a private repo uh, offer, but you don't have to. We don't have to. 2,000 plugins are free. We are open source. So we can I, either we, we use this architecture or we build it ourselves, and everything is lying there. It's just waiting to go. So that was that what I just said here. So what are the hurdles for Moodle to implement that one? The first thing, as you see, everything I, I was doing here was using so-called semantic versioning. That means we have three digits of versioning. One dot, two dot, three. Three are minor patches, two are minor updates, and the first, first uh, gray is major upgrades. We, we even struggle to have this at uh, Moodle level itself. It's my opinion, yeah. So I'm ranting a bit. So, but uh, um, we, sh we, uh, if we are running from 3.1 or 3.4.1 to 4.2, we're just doing the same as if we were running from 3.9 to 4.1. So, even if the jump from three to four should be considered a major upgrade, the process is exactly the same. Why? I, don't, I never got that. Why the steps from 3.1 to 3.2 is the same as if I go from 3.9 to 4.1. The first two steps in the, the first two chars are considered major upgrades. If you're in the, in the logic, it's, uh, for me, it's a, a no-go. We should have a major upgrade, which just now um, every minor upgrade should be a major upgrade. That, that's why we have uh, Drupal now in version 10, since four years. Drupal 7, or since 10 years. Uh, before that, we really had 7, 8, 7, 9, 7, 10, 7, 13, and so on. We ha have them, but that are minor upgrades. That are running with the same major code base. We don't have any uh, deprecated codes or deprecated libraries or whatever. APIs are the same. That's something that handles uh, the minor. And major upgrades is where, where you uh, deploy code where some things break, get incompatible, are old, whatever. So Moodle itself should consider a refinement of their versioning system. And if we go into the plugins, we have the same system. Actually, we are just defining this version PHP file, and we have usually a date. This plugin is from 2023 08-21, and then maybe you know, a two-digit version number for the day, because every developer is committing five times a day, one plugin before it's running really good. So that's why we have those two digits. The good ones take five, the others 67. Uh, just a guess. So, okay, but that's, that's an issue we have. 
uh, the directory structure, which I'm sorry, I, I couldn't get into that one, but there is a slight start support in Composer for Moodle. So we can have a Moodle installation. We just have to get rid of the actual Composer JSON file we have in Moodle, and then we can install uh, plugins. It's working. Um, but there, with this versioning based on date, it's very difficult to define a constraint. So I would have to say, uh, okay, give me every plugin. This plugin should only work from, I don't know, the 21st of July 1999 and younger. So that's not really an option. So we should uh, push uh, our plugin developers just to include a composer JSON file. It's effortless. It's four rows of defining uh, dependencies, defining a version, and everything. And that would make 2,000 plugins compatible to use with Composer. And uh, we have quite good documentation inside the Moodle community how a plugin is supposed to look, how a plugin is supposed to, to uh, we, we have good code checks in, in our uh, tracker and our uh, everything. And that should be part of that. So just consider pushing a Composer JSON file and tagging it correctly in your GitHub repository, and you're done. Then you have the first step to a running Composer environment. Yes, OK. So we are able to provide custom repos and sources in Composer. Composer has plugins, so we can get around some issues we have with Moodle. Um, and if we want to run a known package server, there are two or three out there that are already cloning the Moodle uh, plugin repository and, and building that one, but they are not working very well because of those constraints, missing versions, and so on. So that's something we have. This would be a project just now if we had two hours. <laughs> so what I wish from Moodle is First, get rid of the Composer JSON file we have now in the repo, and, or change the type from project to Compo Moodle core. If we do that, we are able to handle this uh, core code better. So that would make things easier. Just now, it's only possible to get rid of the included Composer JSON and writing it from scratch. Uh, then we would, it would be cool to have a central Git, group, uh, Git repo with all uh, plugins. Uh, correctly uh, compiles the JSON and every one of them. Uh, then we should stand on a semantic versioning uh, in plugins and in Moodle core itself. And it would be cool in the, in the long end to have a, all, uh, an own package server for Moodle. So, questions? We had questions. Any more? Not really? I think it was a long three days. And this, this is the last stuff I think, OK, you, you will sleep very well tonight. So. But uh, yeah, what, was there anything? Yeah, there's a question. Are you aware of uh, a tool uh, and a platform maybe also that uh, it's a package repository for Moodle plugins? automatically updated from the uh, Moodle plugins directory. Yes. I think it's called Moodle Gist, something like this. Like packages, Moodle Gist, something yeah, like this. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I know that. I said that we have two or three, but I would like to have that from the Moodle core team uh, just to ensure the code quality. And uh, even here, we, we all have to be sure that the uh, uh, chain where we are fetching our stuff from is trusted. But and I, I would like to have Moodle but, core but team. But this yes. draws from the API of Moodle uh, packages. Yeah, yeah, I know, exactly. So there's nothing that it's, it only applies some transformation to yes. the, and it has version, uh, uh, like uh, uh, version dependencies. It yes. has all the latest versions that are quality control on the package uh, director of Moodle. So it's only a layer of of bringing this yeah. to the composer. Exactly, and you, and you, can, you, nice. you, can, you can define. Uh, it works very nicely. What's missing there? Yes. Maybe 
uh, any other plugins that are not published on the uh, on Moodle pack yeah. uh, packages, then it's difficult to get into your composer. And then Moodle itself, as you're saying, it's not composer friendly on its own, having this composer JSON file that it's mostly for development and it's not defining uh, its package as a composer package. Yes. Yeah, I know. I, and, I've... and also the Moodle installer that it's part of the installer, it's not compatible with some new versions of plugins. Yeah. The tiny plugins, for example, they're not there. The payment gateways, I think they're not there. So, yeah. Because not many people are using it. And the more this, hmm. I agree with you, would be become a practice, uh, yes, this can definitely improve a lot both the development, the deployment, and uh, upgrades, yeah. all kinds of stuff. Yeah, exactly. I'm with you. And that's, that's exactly the point. Uh, we, we come to you shortly. Um, CITES, as a, as a standalone uh, packages server, can even work for you as a provider of those solutions. If I would have five or six installations of that case I'm running just now, I would surely run an own packages server with trusted plugins I am supposed to use, and then I just would set that dependency in my own projects, go to Karsten Packages and ha get the, the stuff there, and I'm sure which code got deployed. So that's one thing, and there is another question. Yes? Actually two. Okay. But you have to hurry up. The, we're, the, the we're first out one is time. short. Do you have a tracker in Moodle about these changes that you? No, discussed? not yet. Not yet. I, uh, th there are some composer requests uh, lying around in I don't know 2019 or whatever. But I think I, I, I'm a first time uh, Moodler here on on this uh, uh, conference. So I should have been in the uh, track yesterday that happened here and have a five minute uh, presentation about this because it's a proposal. We, we should have a group on Moodle taking care of this one. So, but before you all leave, I had a challenge. What the biggest issue Moodle has now? And I can't leave uh, without that one because my wife would kill me if I don't take the opportunity to talk to, I don't know, 50 people. And the biggest challenge we have is the climate crisis. Lifelong learning means you have to live and have a place to live. And if we don't fix that, we won't have pupil, students, whatever. So remember that when you book your flight ticket, I took a 20-hour train ride from Germany. So I, I raised my radius from uh, under 1,000 kilometers to 1,500 kilometers is possible by train. It's hard. And you have to book a good room at your hotel to sleep just now. But that's the way to go. Without that, we can just scrap Moodle. I said. it. So, and the, the time frame we have to act is quite short. So, keep that in mind when you leave. Thank you for attending this one, and uh, I wish you were, a, a very good home uh, uh, journey home. Stay safe and keep calm. <laughs>